Can I just share a tiny bit about Hotez? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, he's pretty great. The amazing Hotez. The amazing Peter Hotez. Uh, Nature This Week. Vaccine specialist Peter Hotez. Scientists are under attack for someone else's political gain. You don't say. I don't think he's talking about us. No. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the funny thing is, um, he's right. He's right. Scientists yeah. are under attack for someone else's political gain. Yeah. Peter Hotez's political gain, and he's the one doing the attacking in right. many cases. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's an amazing thing to say. Yeah. Uh, the physician researcher who spoke out against misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic says attacks against science are formidable and getting worse. Yeah, we noticed. <laughs> Okay, so, I mean, this is ridiculous. This whole thing's ridiculous. It's a book review because Hotez has a book out. Oh, yeah. Um, and um, The Deadly Rise of Anti-Science, A Scientist's Warning, um, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Johns Hopkins has been terrific during all of this as well. I just want to scan to the bottom of this ridiculous thing and um, share the last paragraph. Okay, how can this be stopped? What's your advice for dealing with online trolls? Have you changed anyone's mind? In your book's dedication, you thank police departments and hospital security forces for keeping your family safe. How do you deal with fear? Uh, the end of that answer, he says, they, with regard to the right-wing media, stoking fear and outrage. Uh, no, stoking the faux outrage machine, monetizing the internet. They couldn't care less about me. It's what I represent, he says. Ooh, shades of Fauci. Shades of Fauci. Shades indeed. of Fauci. Okay. Yeah. So what's your message to scientists? Nature asks Hotez in its final adoring uh, question to him. Understand, Hota says, that science and scientists are under threat, and it's a coordinated campaign. What you're doing as a scientist is noble. Scientists should feel good about what they do. By reading my book, you shouldn't be demoralized. Understand that it's not you who's doing something wrong. You're under attack for someone else's political gain. Even though it's scary, I think there's some comfort in that. Yeah, that takes something from a guy who's still... Uh pushing mrna vaccines uh, for kids yeah the ball's on this guy yeah um amazing uh tiny but a very effective apparently yeah i guess in this case maybe the gall is, is a better like imagine imagine him covered in galls or something <laughs> <laughs> i will hold my tongue about all the things that one might say connecting galls for those of you playing along at home mm. are the swellings on plants induced by insects who then lay their eggs inside these um they're not attractive, and the plants presumably don't like them. They're not good for the plants. No, it's not good for the plants. Yeah. Um, pretty cool, though. I always, uh, Very interesting. I always, always I'm intrigued when I encounter them. Yeah. Ralph Barrick uh, at uh, Chapel Hill is the um, primary architect of the set of techniques uh, in gain-of-function research used to turbocharge and enhance especially coronaviruses. In other words, though we think much of the work that resulted in coronavirus happened in Wuhan, the precursor work that uh, created the insight into how to modify viruses to take them from a state in which they were not an effective human pathogen into a highly effective human pathogen came from the Barrick lab. He famously innovated <coughs> what he called noceum techniques, which meant that not only was he able to make modifications that made these things into deadly pathogens, um, but he was able to do so in a way that was invisible to those who might look in and see whether some modification had been made. And uh, the kind of research that he was doing, that he was uh, doing primarily in the U.S., uh, had a, a cease and desist order placed on it under the Obama administration, uh, and then... Uh, Fauci's NIAID helped move much of that research offshore to uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Yeah, so I sort of think of Barrick as the guy who made all this possible and Fauci as the guy who made it all happen, all right? Um, anyway, Barrick has been um, quite quiet. When he pipes up, it is because something important is afoot. And so, Zach, if you would show... Um, the Barrick paper. What happens here is that Barrick attempts to revive the hypothesis that many will remember from the very early parts of the pandemic that the intermediate host between horseshoe bats and humans for SARS CoV 2 was pangolins. Now, this work is long discredited. 
there were coronaviruses found in pangolins. These were pangolins that were being smuggled. There's no ecological explanation for why pangolins would be harboring these bat viruses. There are many, many reasons to discount this explanation. But what Barrick attempts to do here is create an unfalsifiable explanation of how this virus came to humans and left no trace. Now, as, as our viewers will remember me talking but about... Can I just read what I'm seeing here? Yeah. Like, this is brand new to me. Um, Pangolins, which harbor distinct SARS-CoV-2 related strains, are an endangered solitary species but are valuable as illegal trade commodities. On the basis of broad ACE2 receptor usage of PGCOVGD, documented airborne transmission potential and efficient growth in primary nasal airway, airway epithelial cells, we suggest that individual pangolins, or perhaps some other rare wildlife species, was productively infected and served as a nearly untraceable pass-through species that transmitted virus to humans? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Is he serious here? Yes, um, and then he says, such rare events might be enhanced if early human cases were immunosuppressed, potentially generating complex mutational variants during persistent infections. So make no mistake what's going on. Barrick is creating a theoretically possible pathway sure. that would leave no evidence. If you started with the, if you said, Dr. Barrick, the virus did not come from a lab. What is your best explanation of how it might have gotten to us without leaving any evidence of an intermediate host in which it circulated or evidence in early human populations where rapid evolution took place because it was poorly adapted when it first made its way into people. Mm -hmm. If you said, come up with your best, your best scenario that will accomplish these things, you would come up with something like this. Doesn't make it plausible, but the point is, what he is hypothesizing oh, here- I, th I think best could be better than this. Nope. You don't think so? You're not understanding the assignment. Okay, <laughs> what's the assignment? Yeah, I don't. The I assignment don't. is exonerate the lab with an unfalsifiable hath hypothesis that could have happened. Oh, you don't mean like scientifically best, most plot. This like, is like, scientific garbage. Right. You don't this mean is unfalsifiable most support. Nonsense. It's like put aside lab as a possibility. Now, what's the most supported hypothesis right. out there? So the base. That's not what you're going. The for, basic um, reality is that jumping between species is much, much harder than the people who have been getting grant after grant on the basis that it was always threatening to happen have led us to believe. Mm -hmm. And it leaves a signature because you have to have these periods of evolution in which the virus gets better at uh, infecting people and then very importantly, jumping between them. It has to do that. So what he's done <coughs> is he has cooked up a scenario in which an immunosuppressed person becomes like a little gain of function laboratory unto themselves, having gotten the virus from a pangolin. And the basic point is that's why we haven't found any evidence, right? It's, it's a complete nonsense story designed to exonerate the lab once again, bringing pangolins back in, because as long as we're now dealing with unfalsifiable fantasy bullshit, might as well be pangolins, right? Might as well be. Might as well be. This garbage has no place in nature. It's not nature. It's right. not science. Yeah. This is, um, how do we get, at, this is cover your ass, yeah. right? This yeah. is, this is Barrick covering their asses because what they can't have. <laughs> He's a they now? <laughs> uh, well, he yeah, and I all know, of I the people know. who might face a, um, yep. you know, criminal prosecution or who knows what are looking <coughs> for a scientific cloak and Barrick uh, is not as good at generating um, seamless bullshit when it comes to narrative as he is creating seamless bullshit when it comes to genomes. Merlin Tuttle, extraordinary um, bat, and he's a biologist. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and, just, uh, and photographer. And he's responding to this um, Scientific American story called A Secret Weapon in Preventing the Next Pandemic, Fruit Bats. Um, he says, the title appears to promote a better appreciation of bats. However, the next sentence mistakenly claims that bats worldwide are primary transmitters of viruses deadly to humans. This flawed conclusion reached a worldwide audience in 2017 through a study that reported more viruses in bats than in other mammals. It examined nearly twice as many bats as all other animals combined, ignoring the fact that new viruses can be found wherever we look. Nevertheless, it received sensational media coverage worldwide. 
In contrast, a far more thorough study concluded that bats did not harbor more viruses than other animals, but continues to be mostly ignored. As evidenced by the recent Scientific American article, the scary sensationalist study continues to dominate public perception of bats. So I thought I'd look at what the original 2017 study uh, was and what the later, as it turns out, 2020 study was. The 2020 study uh, is by a team of researchers that I don't recognize. The 2017 study, uh, which is the piece of evidence that has since been debunked, uh, that is the basis on which we are blaming bats for things, was published by a team that includes Peter Desek. Oh my God. Oh, so perfect. It's perfect. It's right? perfect. Global Patterns in Coronavirus Diversity, published in Virus Evolution. That is the basis on which now Scientific American and the whole damn world is blaming bats because they're a really easy culprit. Right. Blaming bats for our own uh, arrogance. And so this, this, is, the, this is the perfect um, uh, link with Barrick because Barrick is here creating fantasy stories, completely unscientific, anti-scientific fantasy stories about how it is that this terrible virus got into people when in fact, how did it get into people? You, Dr. Barrick, that's how it got into people. You figured out how to do this and whether you actually wielded the pipette or it was done in Wuhan doesn't make any goddamn difference. This was your boilerplate piece that was posted in all of your grant applications and all of the publications that came from them swearing that your work was the thing that was going to prevent the pandemic. It was the arrogance that allowed you to believe that that shit was true that actually created the pandemic. And you can blame the bats, you can blame pangolins, you can blame frozen ferret badgers, but the fact is it was you, it was Fauci, it was Daszak, it was Anderson, Right, these people are, you know, from yep. no CM edits to cover up. These are the people who make this possible. And by hiding what happened, you're making it certain it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you've unleashed a, a, a novel virus on the world, yeah. and uh, we'll never get rid of it. Which we're stuck with. Yeah, we're stuck with it. Uh, and um, it's unforgivable. Honestly. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, owning up to what you did uh, would be a start and you owe it to us whether or not it's forgivable.